State of the Sun Devils with Jeremy Schnell, Jesse Morrison, and Mitch Bereldis, an Arizona sports podcast. Hello and welcome into another edition of State of the Sun Devils alongside Jesse Morrison and Mitch Ferreldis. I'm Jeremy Schnell. We're doing a basketball preview today. The men's Hoopers. team and the women's team about to get started. Monday is the first game for either of those teams and it is the women's team taking on UTSA at Desert Financial Arena at 6 p.m. So if you're listening to this and you got time, get over to that game and go watch the women's team play. It's going to be a fun year. Let's start out with the men's team, though, guys. Uh, interesting offseason. They lost a lot of players. Um, yeah, can we rewind, actually, just to like, yeah. set the tone? Yeah. So they lose the heartbreak air to TCU in the 64, right? Up by and, nine with like six minutes left in the right, uh, and half. at the same time, like Frankie Collins and DJ Horn are keeping the minute towards the final stretch. Jemiah Neal is kicking ass, like all the stuff that we love. And then they lose on the last second shot. And then what was it? Like a week later, they announced the contract extension for Bobby. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then it was like the max exodus of max exodize. Yeah, it was really interesting. Just like the timing of everything. I, I didn't understand. Like, if, e- yeah. Even if they're not related, I agree with you. The timing is very, very peculiar. And that kind of sets us up to where we are right now. There are, there's what, three returning players on this three current Three key roster? returning players. Yes, three key returning some players. Walk-ons Outside back. of the walk ons, yeah. Yeah. And, so, yeah, Frankie Collins, Jemaya Neal, Alonzo Gaffney all back. I expect at least Frankie Collins and Jemaya Neal to start. Maybe Gaffney too at the forward position. We'll see. Um, I like those two players. We'll get into that a little bit. Let's. You you went through uh, some of the players. Yeah. Um, it's a long list. I mean, it's huge. I mean, uh, Austin, so, I feel like Austin Nunez is the the biggest piece. That one that hurts I'm really the most. He came on really strong towards the end of the season, yeah. uh, Jesse, particularly in some of those conference games that were on the road. Like that was where yeah. Austin really shined. Yeah, and he was you know early in his career. Same with Duke Brennan, and they were both players that I could have seen, you know, really building and staying here at Arizona State. And Duke becoming, Brennan would have been the starting center on this team, probably. Easily. Yeah. What Warren Washington could have come back. Yeah, that's th- he had the option, but that's what I was. That's what I was going to say. Warren Washington transferred, um, and Devin Cambridge transferred, and those two I think are the biggest losses. Just because, yeah, we're looking at Austin Nunez, Duke Brennan. They were going to be players that were, you know, up and comers that we saw make some strides last year, but kind of the star players that they could have had back in Warren Washington and Devin Cambridge who are on this tournament team for ASU they're gone and Devin Cambridge is the one that is just bizarre to me because he originally said I'm coming back he made a post about it then he transferred or announced that he was transferring to Oregon Oregon but, State or, or no it was no, Oregon, it was Oregon. Yeah, Oregon. Yeah. and now he is Texas, at Texas Tech, Tech I believe that's where he actually transferred yeah. to be with Warren Washington so if you want to watch those guys, was, it's going to be they're going to be a Texas Tech Red Raiders. He was year. also looking to possibly go back to Auburn. I saw as well. Yeah. there was a possibility about that it's happening. Just a really weird situation. Yeah, well, the I'll whole tell you thing. What, if there. they're there next year, conference opponents once again. I think this is it for them. <laughs> no, I think I, it's like their I'm fifth or sixth either. years for both of them. I'm in agreement with you though, as far as the losses to Nunez and Brennan. I kind of point to those more so because of what Nunez was able to provide as a true freshman and then same for Brennan as well and that felt like those could have been two guys that were set up to be the next core of this Bobby Hurley unit I was specifically sad that Austin Nunez didn't get a chance to play in the tournament this year he got injured the concussion right yeah Yeah. and I I thought that he would have provided a big spark off the bench Uh, it ended up being uh, Jemiah Neal believe it or not to really provide that spark that would have been in the place of Austin Nunez at that point so hopefully that's a sign of things to come for Jemiah Um, and to go back to the key losses guys it was really defense that helped the Sun Devils win as many games as they did last season with yeah. the 23 wins. The defense was spectacular um and it was due to Warren Washington and Desmond and Devin Cadebridge, excuse me, anchoring that backside, Jesse. Yeah, and Duke Brennan as well off the bench. Sure. Like they had size down there, um strength down there in in the post. Um they could guard uh 
guards as well with the guys that they had. Um, we didn't even mention the couple players that have graduated and won't be with this team. Des, of course. Obviously, Des Cambridge Jr., who you know will probably go down as a Sun Devil legend, just given just the, off the shot, the alone. shot alone, and just <laughs> kind of what he did all season for the team last year. He was probably their strongest player, and then you talk about. Um, losing Luther Muhammad off the bench. He's another, you know, key bench player, key older guy on the team that they lost. And then we, we didn't even mention that they lost DJ Horn, who yeah. was kind of the one two punch with Desmond Cambridge A little, Jr. It it was uh possibly everybody was saying that he might have been homesick and that's why he went home to his, NC State. NC State, yeah. His yeah. transfer I defend the most more than the rest of yeah. them because we all knew that he was from that part of the country and I'm sure for one last season in college he just wanted to be closer to home. So I yeah, totally so defend the decision. DJ is at NC State and that's a big loss though with that backcourt. Two guys that are really good in Desmond Cambridge Jr. and DJ Horn. So, yeah, there's a lot of unknown with this team because they're bringing in, as we will get to here, um, a lot of guys that haven't had much experience at the big-time college basketball level. Yeah, so Bryson Long is coming in. He's the key transfer, I think, that's really going to help the scoring. And You like him a lot. Yeah, I do. It's really because, specifically, they lost... Desmond Cambridge Jr. And all summer I was like, okay, who's going to be the scorer on this team? Is it going to be Jemiah? Is it going to be Frankie? Who's going to step up, right? And now you've got a guy who has scored at the college level, 14.8 points a game, 80% free throw shooting. I think he could definitely be that guy for this team. The problem that I see, and this will probably be what we run into, and Jesse mentioned it with a lot of these transfers in, the lack of experience at power five schools like Bryson Long may be a fantastic addition for the offense specifically in his final or what could be his final year but he did played well at Houston Christian right yeah not to dog him but the jump from a Houston Christian to an Arizona State where the Pac-12 is actually going to be really really tough this year we know Arizona is a perennial UCLA is a perennial we might actually even see Bronny James this year for USC and we have high expectations for them as well and they have some players coming back this year as well that are key to that team. Right. They're going to have far better, like those three in general, are going to have far better consistency when it comes to their programs, and they're going to be a tough fight. I'm not saying that Bryson's not up for the challenge, because I believe that he is. Otherwise, why would you transfer here at all? But it's probably going to be a bit of a shock to start. And thankfully, they start with some non-conference games. But I'm still curious to see how quickly he can adapt to this level of play. Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of those guys on this team. Some of the 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 real player on this team um and they're still pending NCAA approval mm. and all that stuff, but Adam Miller is a guy, you know, he shot pretty poorly, 33.6% at LSU last year, but he did average 11.6 points per game. At, you know, he got a lot of playing time in the SEC which is a pretty good basketball conference. Um, Especially last year. Yeah, Mm -hmm. in addition to being a good football conference. And so I don't, you know, I think that he could be the guy that steps up for this team if he is indeed allowed to play. Um, And then Kamari lands as well for me, coming in from Louisville. Had limited action there. Very limited. Louisville, ACC, and another thing I wanted to point out is with Lands and Long, they're both 85 plus percent free throw shooters. Or la- ASU last season, struggled ASU with. has struggled year in and year out making big free throws. So that is encouraging to me. And one thing that doesn't, I think, dip from level to level is being able to shoot free throws. Maybe a crowd at a bigger school will influence that a little bit more. But I think that. If you can shoot free throws at it at a lower level, you can shoot them at any level. So something that I also like is, you know, those two players specifically have more years of eligibility after this season. That's something that when the transfers came in last year, it was kind of in limbo. Okay, the players that are coming in, some of them, you know, maybe they'll have an extra year of eligibility. We knew Desmond Cambridge Jr. would not. So they're 
basically best player throughout most consistent player throughout the season yeah. was going to be leaving. Now, if these two players end up working out and becoming the two best scorers on this team, they have a chance to come back next year and maybe even a few more years after that for lands in particular. One guy I really like is Zane Meeks from San Francisco and San Francisco. They play in the West coast conference, which again is a, a little bit of a stronger mid-major conference. You've got Gonzaga, you've got uh, St. Mary's. Even you know San Francisco has been a pretty good program. They're no they're no slouch. They beat ASU last year, so that gives me a little bit more confidence about this team. Um, but again, they do have some of their bigger players coming in. Were our guys from JUCOs and mid-majors and. You know, you look at Bryant Selimbange, and he uh, he played for Tulsa last year, which was a bad— They won three games. Yeah, bad mid-major team. He was a beast, 12 points per game, 9.2 rebounds per game, but again, at Tulsa. So I'm excited to see what he can do because they always need rebounders, and, you know, you can throw him under the basket, see, see what he can do down there, but just his— Lack of experience against big time competition is what kind of scares me and just kind of scares me overall about this entire roster. And it's just it's it's impossible to judge this team until you actually watch a game and even probably until middle of the season because they've never played together other than three guys on this team and and some of the walk ons and some of the yeah and some of the walk ons. <laughs> But like they really haven't played in a game situation together. <laughs> and so we, we don't know if Adam Miller is going to be able to play. And so who knows is basically my take for, for this team. So who knows? Like, could be could be really good, could be mid, could be terrible. So <laughs> I, I think the two big headlining parts of what this roster is, is the fact that it's transfers and then it's transfers that don't necessarily, not all of them, but most of them, don't necessarily have the Power 5 experience. Or if they're coming from a different Power 5 program, they didn't have nearly as much playing time as some of their fellows. But the other part of that is, a lot of these transfers are coming in on the younger side of their years in college. Correct. So you've got some sophomores, you have some juniors, you have red shirt juniors even so you're not just getting these guys for a single season as we mentioned about with des we hope we're, we're hopeful right because players have left after single season i understand that but the hope is or the understanding is the expectation is that they're going to be here for at least two seasons and that gives me hope about the future of this arizona state basketball men's basketball program because of the recruiting class they potentially will have coming in next year. I mean, we already know, we're not going to name them right now, but we already know about three recruits coming in, and one of them in particular, ooh, that is a good get by Bobby F. and Hurley right there. And I will say this real quick. Um, as of two days ago, uh, this is from Devil's Digest on Twitter, uh, Bobby Hurley said that he feels confident, or says ASU as a whole feels confident or optimistic that Adam Miller's waiver is going to, you know, go through and he's going to be able to play for ASU this year. So good. That, that's a that's a positive. That's good yeah. because the last thing we need is the NCAA getting in the way of ASU students wanting to just, you know, play, and which th just happened. And then there's Jose Perez, who didn't play at West Virginia last year, but he was very good at Manhattan when he did play there. So I'm I'm like intrigued to see what he can do as a backup guard on this team. He was 18 points, 18.9 points a game at Manhattan in the 21-22 season. Again, though, it's Manhattan. Right, but again, that's scoring at the Division One level. Sure, but it's still <laughs> Manhattan. It's, it's ba college basketball is weird, man. Yeah, like, I know. Well, like the, the biggest experience that these some of these schools will get is the very early on non-conference games where the team will pay them to come to their place or they have it set up like ASU does this every year. Well, they'll go to a couple of tournaments early in the season and that's how they'll knock out some of those non-conference games. ASU in particular, they're focusing on more power five schools so that they can get some aggressive competition early on really help that strength of schedule because we know in the past them even qualifying for the NCAA tournament has been a, a hair pulling uh, endeavor. 
But that's how some of these guys, most of these guys really get their opportunities through the non-conference games. It's just very, very few and far between. I'm just really intrigued to see what he can do to help out this team off the bench. Yeah. Whether it's scoring off the bench, whether it's facilitating, he can do it all because he was a freshman the same year as R.J. Barrett, believe it or not. (laughs) And um, Wow. And he was one of two freshmen to record a triple-double that season alongside R.J. Barrett. Wow. Yeah. And... I, I won't slight this, though. That 18.9 points per game is really good. In college basketball, and specifically. And it'll probably translate to something like 10 to 12. You would hopefully. hope. You would hope. And that could really help this team off the bench if he does play, which last season he did not at West Virginia for some reason. Um, you want to talk about the big men? Yeah, please. Because with Gaffney coming back, I think he can kind of set the tone. And we didn't even mention Enoch Bowachi, who was pivotal for them in terms of like the size he was able to give but his minutes were very varied last year so would have liked to see him play a little bit more i thought he excelled when he was out there last year but there's a lot of high hope particularly from hurley um he was quoted back at their first practice like back in september i think the one you attended jesse Mm -hmm. uh talking about sean phillips who's coming in from lsu and who hurley is quoted as saying uh the most gifted front court guy he's had and Look, Hurley is a talent evaluator. He does a fair to above average job. I mean, we've seen some of the recruits he's brought in. We've seen the transfers he's brought in. Some of them to great success. Others to basically bailing on the program after a year or leaving the program after a year. Or never even really getting started. Right. Sean Phillips is a guy that I hope that they can keep here for the remainder of his college tenure. Because he's intriguing. Again, it's just it's one of these things as as Wolf likes to say, he's just got to prove it because last year his numbers at LSU weren't they're not great. Great, so I just got to see it before I'm really like enthralled with what Hurley has to say about him because again, I, it's it's what you see on the court. It's not the hype that people provide you. But again, it's always good to have size, especially a seven footer, which ASU has struggled to get seven footers to stay on the court in terms of their defense for some reason. Something about size and Bobby Hurley, it just hasn't I don't... There's worked a, with there, Warren. Like, it there's a few. It worked great with Warren, but there, there haven't been a ton of big men that have been successful under Hurley, specifically here at ASU. I, I don't want to speak to his time. Under, unless they're under seven foot, because some of them yeah. like they, they'll play a six foot eight guy at, at center, and they'll do great, but it's all I've always wanted to have that seven footer like Warren last year who was able to play in the post against these big guys. Look, Balo didn't go anywhere. Right. <laughs> He's still down there in Tucson. We would have thought for sure when they <laughs> got <of> Shaq. <laughs> we would have thought for Olsen sure when um, Hurley was able to bring in Euro Splosic all those years ago. We would have thought, oh man, he would have been perfect. And then basically never saw the court and, and, and then became a menace at Tennessee. Like, yep. How how does that keep happening? So I'm really hopeful that Sean Phillips Jr. can be that guy for Hurley. I would, I, yeah. I mean, that is one of the other ones that I'm like, I'm intrigued about because he's got potential, kind of like the Jose Perez thing. Yeah. Like, what are we going to see from those two guys? And it'll be interesting to see because maybe Sean Phillips starts um, starts the season alongside. Gaffney. Again, we we don't even really know the starting lineup. Like no. it's it's. Not I think there's only easy one guy, at all. There's really only one, maybe two guys, and we mentioned it earlier. Frankie's probably the starting point guard, and Jemiah's probably the starting shooting guard. Outside of that, I don't know, and, and I'm very curious to see what it will be for I, a majority of the and season. And they're gonna probably throw Miller at small forward, maybe keep, keep him at guard. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. Jemiah could probably play small forward too. Yeah. Would you guys start Gaffney just like? The base, looking at the roster, everything we, that we've discussed, is Gaffney Jesse, a starter? We kind of like him off the bench, really. J- uh, Jemiah? No, Gaffney. Oh, Gaffney? Yeah, we um, like him coming off the bench, don't we? Like, last year when we saw... Like, we would sit down and watch the games in, in the Pac-12 tournament specifically, and there were some games where we were like, why is he playing so many minutes? And then there were some games where we were like... Can we get some more? <laughs> Can we get some more of him? He looks <laughs> yeah. good. Here's so he's thing. like kind of up and down. So that's why I'm like, yeah, if you want to set the tone, you keep him on the bench. In the 21-22 season, I really liked everything that Gaffney did. Pretty much every time he went in, I was like, this guy needs to play more. Uh, last year, it was more of a mixed bag. I don't know what to expect this year. 
but he did have some good moments last season, and he is a talented player. So who knows? But I definitely think he's a bench player. And then last player that we'll go over, and that's Davis. So I, I think in terms of him, Malachi Davis, tennis, Tallahassee Community College, shout out Florida State. Um, he averaged over 17 points a game last year at a community college, right? It's still a lot of points. Can that translate to the D1 level? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> It just the wait knows? and see game. I mean, look, wait and see. Look, same we, thing with everything. We've we've brought it up several times, but if if I've taken too long to mention this particular fact, is that sooner or later you get to the top of the ladder of where you're at, right? So for Malachi, he probably has gotten to the last rung on the ladder as far as how good of a JUCO college player can you be. He's done that. Now we're just curious. All right, you're kind of starting over. You have a new ladder now that you need to climb. How good of a collegiate player or non -ju non juco collegiate player can you be? Does he have a massive role? Is he one of their leading scorers towards the end? Because he was a big scorer at juco level. Like he was one of their better players. Can and I uh, can I jump in here real sure. quick and just say something kind of random? But you're asking a lot of questions there. I feel like we've asked a lot of questions. Just you know, rhetorical questions in this podcast. That's what we're about, baby. Here's the, he, doing preview podcasts in this era of college sports is really hard. <laughs> yeah. Who because knows? Because it goes... Because, who knows? Yeah. There's there's always new players. You never know who's going to, you know, be together on a team. It's just, it's like a wait and see approach with all of this stuff. And so, you know, I don't know how to judge this team. I don't think I even know how to judge the women's team when we get to get to that point. Okay, can I ask a fun question then that is non-rhetorical? Yeah. yeah. How many games does Bobby Hurley Jr. get this year? <laughs> uh, three. Seven. Oh, seven. I got so three. So he appeared in six games Yeah. last year. Seven. You think seven? Yeah, either games that they're, they're below. I don't know, though. Bobby doesn't like to go to his uh, bench players, into the bench guys that much. He'll leave his only in like super big blowouts. Yeah, and it'll be like fifty seconds left in the game. Yeah. So mm, I don't know. I'm gonna say five. I'm gonna go five. Five Not games. Seven, five for BHJ. See me in the press box all the time. Three. He's a nice guy. I got three. Three games. Yeah. I'll go. I've never over. actually said hi to him. But I'll go slightly over Jesse's I see five. Him. I but think I, he works media relations. I just wonder ASU. if it gets to a point where he's actually good enough to get consistent playing time. You know. That's, I mean, if we're going back to the, we just don't know anything about college, right? We see it in football all the time. Walk-ons will get scholarships as a result of called upon last second. You did a great job. Here's a scholarship. Same can happen to the basketball world, too. And I'm curious if it'll happen this time around. Because there's just literally so much unknown, particularly with this roster. All right, we touched on the defense a little bit earlier, guys. And that was kind of the staple of last year's team. I just... I, I don't know. We, we've we said a couple of times, we don't know what we're going to get from this team. Do you think the defense can be as good as last year's team or be kind of a staple on this year's team? Yeah, I mean, that's Bobby Hurley's strength as a coach is the defensive end. So I expect that to continue no matter who the personnel is. And I think he has probably figured out by this point to pick up players that are going to fit that mold so yeah i expect the defense to be pretty good to back that up um the career asu basketball teams that have the best field goal percentage defense asu's team last year held opponents to a 399 field goal percentage and then not far removed from that is the 21 22 team that held teams to a 440 percent field goal percentage those are both in the top four of asu basketball all time so if nothing else, Bobby Hurley for the preaches, men's program. I'm sure that sure, sure, I'm yeah. sure that Charlie has. Like I'm sure Charlie has a few like candles. on Twenty nine percent. I should have clarified that's for the men's team. But that last year's defense defensive field goal percentage is the second best in its history, second to the 1962-63 team that held to three the thirty nine point one percent opponent. If nothing else, Bobby Hurley's defense makes a mark. And if anything else, doesn't matter who's on the roster, it's getting better year after year after year. 
I mean, I like to see that. I would hope that the defense continues to show up because we've seen ASU's offense struggle. I just would love that for someone to break out and become that offensive star that ASU's been looking for. And they got from a bunch of games from last year from Desmond Cambridge Jr. We all know countless time after time after time again, we're like screaming at the televisions asking so many threes being taken. Why? Why aren't they trying to pound the paint a little bit more? Why aren't they trying the inside shot more? And then after it's the game... It's just open shots I get for it. me. But it, it, it doesn't matter where, where they are. It just seems like ASU is shooting contested three... Uh, contested layup, contested shot in the corner. It just doesn't seem like they get a lot of open shots. I don't really care where they're shooting from because I love threes. Threes are better than two. But Duh. just just make sure that they're open threes and don't pass up on threes. Don't which, pass up on open threes. Which at the same time would explain why there's such an emphasis on defense because if you're having those nights where you're really, really struggling to score, well, you got to keep pace on the opposite end too. And yeah. the last two seasons have shown – that if nothing else, they can hold their own defensively. And they have pretty good reason to do that again this next year. So ASU scheduled to start the season. Not easy, but I think it's going to be a, a fun test uh, when they go to Chicago for the Barstool, Invita- Barstool Sports Invitational when they take on Mississippi State in Chicago. Um, that game on Wednesday at 7:30 Mountain Standard Time will be on Arizona, or excuse me, on ESPN 620 and the Arizona Sports app. So, it's oh, and then be- if I can, uh, a few days later in Tempe, the revenge game against Texas, Texas Southern. Southern. I'll yep, be there. Maybe. I'm covering it. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna actually pull a double dip that day. Uh, this is this is news. I'm breaking news here. I'm You're be, breaking news. I'm gonna be at that game which is at Desert Financial Arena. And yes. then later that night, also at Desert Financial Arena, I'm going to go to the volleyball game. Nice. Ooh. Match. And, match. It's a volleyball match. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, because there's match. games. Yes, come on now. Yeah. We, we, I've got this wrong too many times, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm getting more into volleyball. and it's it's. <laughs> We're happy for you. Man. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, be at, I'll be at the volleyball match. I'll be paying attention to football at the same time. I'll be coming back here, doing the post-game podcast after the UCLA game. And I'll be giving all of the thoughts. We can also react to volleyball, men's hoops, what's happened with the women's hoops teams uh, for the first two games of their season. So We're going to have some very diverse podcasts coming as soon as yeah, next week. Yeah, I'm it's, looking November to it. is like the most fun month to do, the, to do this podcast. So they so. got the Texas Southern revenge game, and then BYU... These are just the games that I would schedule, that I would circle on the schedule. And then another revenge game against San Francisco. And then um, SMU, TCU, Northwestern. Those are the teams that you can kind of circle as like, those games might be tough. The Northwestern one's going to be fun too because that's a part of the the, uh, Jerry Colangelo Hall of Fame series that uh, takes place in downtown Phoenix, a footprint center. Mm -hmm. That's always a good time. um, That uh, particular series always seems to get some really good games on the slate. And f- frankly, ASU Northwestern might be one of them. Yeah. and Hopefully the students show out well for that. I'm nervous about the TCU game in Texas, though. That'll be that'll be fun. <laughs> I think that... There's so much revenge on the calendar. I think that there's going to be three players and some coaches that are really amped up for that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm just going to so, throw that out there. If you're doing your early circling the calendar for revenge games, literally the three biggest ones probably from last year. Texas Southern is November 11th. That's a Saturday in Tempe at DFA. San Francisco is December 3rd. That's a Sunday also at DFA. This one we won't get to go to, but we're going to watch closely. December 16th, the Saturday against TCU as part of the US LBM Coast to Coast, Ch- Coast, to Coast Challenge. Excuse me. In Fort Worth. So, so much for a neutral site game for TCU, but nevertheless. Is that at the uh, Dickies Arena? Um, off of what I'm looking at right now, I cannot confirm nor okay. deny. I believe it's at the, Dis- <laughs> the Dickies Arena. Um, okay, so now we'll jump forward in the schedule a little bit. They don't play Arizona until February 17th. That's that will crazy. be in Tucson. And then two weeks later, they play, or no, that's just 11 days later, they play at home against Arizona. And Jesse, we talked about this last year. The last three games of the season last year were also Arizona, USC, UCLA. The last three games this year will be (laughs) Arizona, (laughs) USC, and UCLA. We do not, as we said last year, want them to back in to the Pac-12 tournament by losing three in a row. Or, Or here's an even better 
here's an even better take. Um, how about <laughs> it doesn't matter by that point in the season so that they can yeah. back into the Pac-12 tournament <laughs> and they're solidly in the tournament. That would be the ideal situation. However, again, I don't know what's going to happen with this team and I have no idea how good they're going to be. Yeah. I mean, we're not we're not going to do a game by game win loss count or anything, but it's but just those it's those 3 games at the end of the season that really worry me. The non-conference schedule is tough and I appreciate Bobby Hurley and Arizona State for scheduling a good chunk of uh, non-conference games early on and like giving them some good opponents so that it really helps the the schedule. But then right out the gate, and I'm not saying these are world beaters, but Jared Hess has been with Stanford forever, so it's not like he's keeling over for the first conference game of the season for them. And then not too far down the road to start off January, you have hosting UCLA and USC – and maybe you'll have – I'm not confirming this. I was trying to read up on it earlier, but nothing's confirmed about his status yet. Maybe Bronny James and the rest of USC. Yeah. Those are going to be pivotal, pivotal games yep. halfway through the, the conference schedule. Yep. And I'm, I'm scared. Do we just want to get to the predictions, Jeremy? Yeah. I, I think I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. The, also, the, I, I can't believe it's going to take until February to play Arizona. Who, who scheduled that? I like that. It's better than having it on the same. I don't like Fiesta waiting Bowl. all year. And guess <laughs> and guess what, guys? I won't be able to go to either of them. Oh, sorry. You're getting married. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. Way You're to rub welcome. it in, jerk. Wait, yeah. Way to rub it in. Yeah. All right. So, what are we predicting? Just overall win total? Yeah. Thirty-one games. Thirty-one games. They won twenty-three last year, which was one of the better uh, amount of wins that they've had in a season. Ugh. Ugh. Doggy. Also um, to go along with your, you know, also to go along with your USC take as you think about where you're going to go with this, these numbers. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, don't forget that uh, Boogie Ellis has come back and is going to destroy ASU. Like he, he was so does. good last year, man. And it's not that he doesn't destroy every other team in <laughs> college Peterson's basketball. Peterson's not back though. <laughs> Peterson's finally gone. That guy was a nightmare against ASU. <laughs> we just know though that Andy Enfield has got a, a heck of a program down there in Southern California. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, all right, I'll simplify as I work my way to a number. I don't think they're going to get to 23 again this year. I think 23 in back-to-back -back years is a very difficult thing to do. But I do think that the rest of the league is going to be, or I guess the association technically, is going to be weak enough that however many wins ASU gets, they could vie for a tourney or a first four spot. Um, so I'll be generous, and I mean very generous, and I'll give them 20 wins out of 31. Yeah, I don't know enough. Uh, you know, I haven't seen them. Like, I haven't seen them play together. Again, not a lot of guys from uh, Power Six schools, I guess, if you want to count the Big East in college basketball. So, yeah. Uh, and then, you know what? It scares me that Adam Miller's field goal percentage was around 34% <laughs> last year. So I'm going to be really conservative and hope to eat crow here, but 12 and 19. Wow. Yeah, I was really down on this team during the summer because they just hadn't brought anybody in, and then things started to pick up, right? As of recent, they brought in, they're bringing in, hopefully, Miller. They brought in Long. And so that kind of gave me a little bit of, you know, optimism for this team. Now, I'm not going to give them 20 plus wins like Mitch, but I think maybe 15, maybe 15 wins this season isn't out of the realm of possibility. Um, so I, yeah, that's what I'll say. 15 okay. wins. Can I throw another prediction in there that I think we should address? Sure. I think they split the, uh, territorial series this year. Yeah. Do you think they beat them back down in Tucson again? No, I think they'll beat them at home. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think, I think Mikhail is going to be fired up for that one in particular, especially how it ended. And I think at the same time, Tommy Lloyd's not going to let the mistakes that happened in that particular outcome happen again. Um, so I think that he's going to have his guys ready. They're going to pummel them down in Tucson. But I think it's going to be a very, very close one here in Tempe. I agree. Now moving on to women's basketball. 8-20 and 20 last season in Natasha Adair's first season with the squad. Yeah. Um, not the best, but, you know, we got to give her a little bit of time to bring in some of her recruits, start to implement her system, and figure things out along the way. So... Not going to judge a coach off her first season here at ASU. 
So also now just that's that said, also just very hard to follow a 25 year coaching tenure for By a legend. Yeah, exactly. Like it's the it's already hard enough to come in as a new coach and try and establish your roster in your first season and then deal with everything that that women's team dealt with last year. Like one of them even being not having enough scholarship players to have a game. Like they had to forfeit games. Two last games year. on a road trip, I believe, to the mountain schools. Utah, and they, and they what, only had six players available or not even? I, I honestly don't even know how many players they had available. They never really shared that. The the point being that, you know, they went through so much strife yeah. last year and already the expectations were lofty to begin with. So, yes, I agree with you as far as patience is concerned with uh, Coach Adair's uh, crew, but a lot of positives, at least in what she's been able to put into this second season. But the negatives is where we'll start, unfortunately, because Meg Newman transferred. You got Eric Strump, who didn't come back this season, right? Yeah, she's at GCU now. Yeah. So, I mean, those are two huge losses for this team. Meg Newman, kind of like uh, what we were talking about, about with the men's team with Duke Brennan, where you were like, okay, well, she can come in and she can start this year, but now... She's gone. Um, and then awful, awful that Ty Skinner is not going to be able to play this Just year. Yeah. At all. Um, their leading scorer last year, really good player. Uh, what she lacks for in size, she makes up for in heart. Um, and it's tough. It's just going to be tough to not have her out there. Um, there were games that she just had to put the team on her back last season. Um, and I don't know how they're going to replace her this year. Uh, that That's going to be re- really tough. And again, I, I don't know if I'm going to give Coach A a pass this season, but again, that's a player that she's so familiar with too because she came from Delaware to Arizona State. And, you know, she was a player that, you know, if we're, if we're going back to the men's team, uh, she was a player that came from a mid-major to a Power big five. school yeah. and – uh, excelled so I know I don't know it's it's going to be a tough season I think for them just without her but they didn't lose as many players as um, the men's team did and they have they have some scores players they that have are, scores they have right scores and they have some players that are coming back off of injury that we either didn't see at all last year or saw very little so that'll be interesting to see as well i'm going to defer a lot to you because you did a fantastic job following the team and covering the team last season uh but the name that sticks out to me most not just because she was on the team last year but because especially now with the loss of uh skinner i really think Jaden simmons has a grand opportunity to step up and be the true like face of this team this year do you agree yeah Jaden simmons has stuck here stuck through it through it all, through the coaching change, through the tough season last year. She is back um, at Arizona State. Um, She's a Sun Devil through and through. um, And she had a good year last year. It was her best year as a Sun Devil. 12.4 points per game last season. um, And she can only build on that this year. I think that as she has become a more confident player. That's the thing with her, I think, is just kind of her confidence. And and she has become a little bit more of a of a uh, confident player. And she's just got to continue that this season. And um, I'd like to see her three-point shooting get a little bit better um, as well. But good passer, can play both the point guard and the two guard. And so she'll probably have to run the point this year. I think because of what happened with Skinner. Um, so she can, you know, maybe her points go down a little bit, but she picks that up and assists. Um, she's, again, a, a really good player. She has this year and even next year if she wants to come back because of the COVID season. So um, this is a big year for her, big year for the program in general. I, I hope that she kind of takes this team and puts – them on her back because she's gonna be the leader gonna be the player that you know is the catalyst for this team i also think they've struck gold with treasure hunt Boom. Boom. but here, here's what i'll say oh, she, gosh, she's man. a fantastic player as well she can she 
really gets on the boards, right? And ASU needs that for from this team. They need a strong presence. They down need low, a strong yeah. presence down low. Not only does she get boards, she scores a lot too. And Jesse, to go back to the end of the season last year. You just He's look, still mad at you for that joke. I, it was just terrible. I think I, I made the same joke last year. I don't understand. It's just, it's just so I don't remember you making that joke, but it's it's <laughs> overall just awful, and we uh, all know why you're doing it. But it sucks. <laughs> so the last five or six games last year, they didn't get blown out necessarily, right? And they won that game at Oregon State, right, seventy-five to seventy-three. But outside of the Oregon game and outside of the Stanford game. You look at some of the scores here, especially that Utah game that we saw, Jesse. Yeah. That, I mean, that was a fantastic performance from the ASU team. They had a chance to win that game. and really, Are you going to fall in love with Utah women's basketball again this If they season? score 100 points a game, I will. They lost pretty early in the tournament. Still, <laughs> score more points. I love scoring points. But I just think that once the team started to recognize the system that Natasha Adair wanted them to run, Jesse and Mitch... I think that they start to understand more how to play within that system, right? And and I think that that can be, you know, like you said, they didn't lose as many players as the men's team lost. That can be beneficial to this season and hopefully having a much better season than winning one Pac-12 game, Mitch. I mean, you can only hope, right? And it doesn't help when two of your Pac-12 games have to be forfeited as a result of, as we mentioned earlier, what is with Arizona I, State and injuries? Yeah, I was going to say, um, if we wanted to relate what we're experiencing with Coach Adair to what we're experiencing with Coach Dillingham in his first year, right? I know this isn't Coach Adair's first season, but now there's already the understanding that going in, one of the better players on this team is not going to be available. And to your point earlier, how do we judge Coach Adair for that? Do we give her an automatic pass before the season even begins because of it? I argue that at the same time, yes, one player makes a massive impact in the game of basketball. You still can be a really, really good head coach and drum up some really good um, plays for the players that are available and utilize them to their strengths. And as we mentioned, between between Jaden Simmons and Treasure Hunt, you have a good top two, like a really competitive top yeah. two. And I, I don't think Coach A herself would want... Uh, us to give her the excuse of sure. her player being out, um, just knowing her, um, I think that she would try her best to win games with the players that she has on on the court. Um, and I'm excited about what's coming in, uh, especially the Miller uh, sisters um, from Idaho, or I'm sorry, from South Dakota, uh, especially That's Mallory fine. Miller. Yeah, I, okay, I get it. I don't have any Jeez cash. Louise. <laughs> uh, I don't have any cash, Jeremy. Um uh, but Mallory Miller was the Miss Basketball of South Dakota last season. So, I mean, that means she's the best player in that state. So. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> There's some obvious analysis for me, but she averaged, I believe, over 18 points a game last year in high school. So maybe they can have an impact. For, I feel like ASU hasn't had that impact freshman in the women's on the women's side in a really long time. You've had hyped up freshmen that come in and then they're they're okay, but they're not like amazing right away. And I think that this player might be the player that is that amazing player right away. You know, it's funny you say that and then I'm trying to think back to some of those Charlie teams and I don't even remember if she played much as a freshman to this that you're looking for, but I think back to like Riley Richardson who played sort of a niche role given how Charlie has structured a lot of her rosters, like not a ton of like point guard play. Like I remember Kiara Russell and of course Riley, I already mentioned, but yeah, as far as like the impact freshman thing goes, it's very hard for, especially in basketball to get a true freshman out there ASAP. And especially I'm kind of on the and, women's side because yeah. the, the, the women stick around and there's, there's no one and done. Yeah. With there's no one yeah. and done with women. So you, you actually have stars in women's college basketball that don't just up and leave after one season, which makes it in my opinion, more intriguing than the men's side. We just haven't seen at ASU a lot of freshman women's basketball players have a lot of success. Even Kiana Ibis, who's probably one of the best players in program history. She, kind of rode the pine as a freshman yep um and you know really blossomed in her later years in school so uh 
maybe uh, Mallory Miller, um, you know, can be the the difference maker freshman that we've been looking for for so many years from this team. Mitch, just you know, an eight and twenty season, you can only go up from there. I feel like I, so, <laughs> I, 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 if they don't go up from eight, then I'm really starting to be. And again, we mentioned the injury, the massive injury up the top, but. Again, you can't go fewer than eight wins. Not a crazy out of conference schedule. Uh, Texas yeah, is the, not crazy. Texas, yeah, Texas is, stands out. Is the is the one that stands out. And South and South Florida is always good um, in that conference. That you know because they have to be because they play against UConn every year. Um, <laughs> well, UConn moved to the Big East, Jeremy. They moved back to the Big East. Oh, but they they do play UConn every year. I'm also saying they get Arizona really early this year. Yeah, like in December, like before they even start any other conference play like it's a arizona it's a, lost a lot yeah i don't know what's going on down there oh that's another fine jesse's down to two dollars wow. i don't have any cash he's down to oh, that's three dollars you're gonna have to start carrying cash around. <laughs> why is it three no, that's four what <laughs> um no but this schedule you know it's just a normal pack 12 schedule and if they can find a way to hopefully win more than one game in the pack 12 this year you know it's going to be much better than than what we saw last year at the same time you're still going against a ton of pedigree like Corey close with ucla tar vanderveer right. stanford and you know oregon and oregon state have been powerhouses in women's basketball for years even in the post sabrina unescu and sydney weiss days like it's it is what it is, Jesse. This is this sport in particular, women's basketball, is where I am the most sad that the Pac-12 is breaking up because it is just so electric every year. There is you don't you don't know who is going like Oregon State had their run you know at one yeah. point like it, you just never know who's Washington going. Washington State Arizona made a run to the final four like yeah. you, you never know who is going to be that team and this is the this is exactly I'm the most sad about the Pac-12 breaking up because of women's basketball yeah you can always make the argument that it's the best conference in women's college basketball it's really sad. Um, I'm happy that ASU gets to play Stanford twice this year just because Stanford, Stanford, like that's one of the, you know, pillars of college women's basketball. Tara is one of the pillars of women's basketball, not just at the college level, at the international level. And I think that just overall, it's it's a really sad. It's it's a tough blow for college sports. All of it is like today this was the last bedlam in football that we'll see for a really long time so it's just it's really sad however we get to cherish this last season of it and you never know what's going to happen and if you can get the opportunity to go to vegas for the pac-12 women's basketball championship i would highly recommend it it's, it's one of the so most fun, fun. it's it's some of the most fun times i ever had is watching that tournament that we got to cover in 2019 yeah it was just incredible because you don't know Washington made it to the semifinals yeah, like the, that, the that year. Team, the teams are <laughs> they're good, even riddled if, with talent, <laughs> even if they don't look like they're good on paper. Mitch, prediction time. <sighs> Do I set the bar slightly above eight? Yeah, probably. <laughs> Do my question is to myself. So I guess rhetorically, I'm asking: Can they get to fifteen? And I. Maybe this is just me coming at it from 30,000 feet. I've always known this conference to be a real bother when it comes to trying to get even half of the wins. Like, Char Charlie was one of the better coaches in the conference at the time that she was here. Even she was struggle against some of these conference schools from time to time. Like, it happens, right? So I'm wondering if I can, if they can get to 15, trying to map it out of my head. For right now, I'm going to go on the safe side, and I'll say they'll get to 13 wins this year. I'm going to go, they again play 31 games, as the men do. I'm going to say that they get... Again, there's some unknowns here. Don't take my number. I'm going to go... Don't take my number. ...with... I'm going to say 12 as well. Dang it, he took my number. For the women's team. I'm also going to say 12. Yeah. I got the highest I, pick. How about I, that? I think 12 is going to be the number that ASU women's basketball gets to this year, and here's why. This is Natasha Adair's first full recruiting class, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of freshmen on this team, and to go back to your point, Jesse, 
it's tough for freshmen to do well coming in right away and starting at the college level. So next year, maybe we'll see them going into a new conference, get up in the high teens and wins. But this year, I'm not sure yet. Get into the tens, right? Get in, get into the tens of win wins, and then about start that, taking that next step. Start to build up <laughs> going into 2024. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for sticking with me throughout this long basketball preview podcast. I'm ready for hoops. Really, man. a lot of hoops. Yeah, I'm ready. It's going to be a lot of fun this year. Um, we don't know what we're going to witness. Really, it's just like Jesse was saying earlier when we were talking about the men's team. A lot of unknown in college basketball nowadays because everyone is transferring. Yep. <laughs> so it's and, even lesser known than football because in football, at least you have like 20, 30, even more than that sometimes guys that are still there that you know about. Um, in college basketball, you don't know any like, smaller you know, roster. A lot of times you don't know a lot about a lot of any of these players. Fewer players on the floor at a time. Like one, even one or two players leaving makes that much massive of an impact. And yeah, I'm not trying, again, I'm not trying to dog on either of these programs um, and, in terms and you're not dogging on the transfer portal either yeah no. exactly i'm just saying you want, that, we want people we want these kids to play where they yeah, get the success block. where you I'm, can get i'm it. saying i'm saying you know i hope to eat crow for the sake of the fan base <laughs> um and i hope both of these teams are really good me too Boom. All right, that's going to do it for this basketball preview edition of State of the Sun Devils. Thank you so much for listening. If you're listening right now and you feel like you are left out, we are waving at the camera right now. That's crazy. Well, we they are. are not. on YouTube. Every episode, almost every episode of State of the Sun Devils, you can find on the Arizona on the Arizona Sports YouTube channel. So please check that out for us. It would mean a lot. You can also find this podcast wherever you get your podcast and on ArizonaSports.com, the Arizona Sports app. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. We have Threads? At AZ Sports Devils on every single one of those platforms. We'll make it easy for you. Please go and follow us all over there. We'll give you all the updates on everything there is to know about ASU Athletics. But for now, for my good friends, Mitch Vareldis friends, and Jesse Morrison. Even good friends. Yeah, I don't know. I'm Jeremy Schnell. We'll talk to you next week.